Okay, hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for the DDU Viva practice this week. Uh, Chris Duncan is going to be presenting. Uh, um, for those of you who don't know Chris, he's one of our sort of visiting intensivists. He's done all his training in the UK. He's joined us doing an ECHO fellowship uh, for the past year. It's been great to have him here. He's an extremely proficient in air transthoracic and transesophageal ECHO. He's got the equivalent of the DDU back in the UK, which is called the BSC Level 2. And he's done that both in transthoracic and transesophageal. So, uh, Chris, absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you very, very much for taking us through some cases today. Thank you. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. So um, as Sam said, like, I can't give you any of the pearls and pitfalls of, of what they like to ask in the DDU exam. But what I've got today is four cases. Uh, the first two are pretty stock standard um, ICU cases. Um, the third one is uh, more of an outpatient scan with lots going on. And the fourth one is a bit of a left field one, um, just to throw, just to um, give you a bit more interest. So I guess we'll we'll go through everything um, individually, much like we did last week, where we'll go through all of the images for each case first. Um, if each person takes e takes a case at a time, and then um, tells me a summary at the end, and then I'll go through and. Um, have manned the PowerPoint and you can go back and forth as you wish. So the first case is a 25 year old um, with a background of SLE and end stage renal failure. So she developed cardiac tamponade five days ago and she had a maximum diameter of five centimeters to her chronic pericardial fusion. She's had a pericardial drain in for, for about four days, but there's been no drainage for the past 36 hours. Um, she's hemodynamically and clinically stable, and there's no cardiovascular or respiratory support. So the request is, um, can we take the drain out? Is there a pericardial effusion left? So just looking at who we've got first. I don't know, if, uh, Ravi, do you want to take this first case? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I'll start going through the, the images. Please just tell me whether you want to see anything um, in a bit more detail or go back and forth yeah. um, as you want. So do you want me to describe the images? Uh, no, should we go through all of the images first okay. and then you give me a summary at the end like we did last week? <clears throat> Just tell me if you want to go back and forth at all. Okay. Do you want me to go back back and look at any of the other pictures, or are you happy to give a summary based on based on that? So, like, I'll try to give a summary, and then uh, <coughs> see. Yeah. So That's this nice. is a young lady with uh, end stage renal disease due to lupus, and uh, she's had chronic pericardial effusion, which uh, led to tamponade. And it was five centimeters that time. It got drained, and the question is whether we can remove the drain based on the images. Yeah. So, uh, going through all the images, uh, she is still having, uh, you know, by definition, severe pericardial effusion because it is uh, more than two centimeters uh, in different views. Uh, then the question is whether she still has a tamponade physiology or because it's a chronic pericardial effusion, whether there is any evidence of constrictive pericarditis. Uh, Going by the apical four chamber view, yeah, that one. So the uh, features that I'm looking for is if there is any septal bounds or deviation of septum, especially with uh, respiration, change with uh, respiration. I can see a bit of septal bounds uh, yeah, in the nice. apical four chamber view. 
and uh, on the color doppler i can only see dilated pulmonary veins there is no uh, there is no mitral regurgitation no significant mitral regurgitation <coughs> Okay, awesome. Um, so if you were going to put that into a into a summary, in a report summary, all of what you've said is great. Um, how we, so there's a few questions that you're being asked. So one, can we take the drain out? And two, um, you a question that you've raised is, is there still tamponade physiology? So if you're going to describe it as, as, as a report summary, um, how are you going to, what, what are your bullet points? And what are you going to say to the attending team? So in report summary, there is still uh, evidence of uh, circumferential uh, pericardial effusion, which is uh, uh, severe by definition. So maximum distance is 2.47. Uh, there is evidence of uh, at least moderate tricuspid regurgitation on color Doppler. There was IVC, which was dilated and not collapsing more than 50%. So there is evidence of right-sided uh, overload, volume overload. Uh, and then I could see the tricuspid and mitral inflow dopplers uh, looking at uh, possibly respiratory variations. And uh, the mitral variation is uh, 22.7, so it's less than 25%. Uh, and tricuspid variation is 36, so it is still borderline. So we are looking for more than 40% variation in tricuspid inflow with respiration and uh, more than, I think it is 25% variation in mitral inflow. Yeah, great. So, I, I mean, I've got 30% on mitral and 40% on 45% uh, on tricuspid, but I think if you look in different places, um, you'll see different things. But um, is there anything else that anyone can see on this top left image that is probably worth noting in the uh, in the report? Um, yeah, so about... if, if you're worried about tamponade, then we're looking at uh, you know, uh, collapse of the right atrium, uh, like early diastolic collapse and uh, collapse of the right ventricle. Yeah, nice. But what, what about something that, that is definitely in this in this view here? So uh, you've already... The septated uh, exudative, yeah. exudative pericardial effusion. Possible yeah. uh, it's yeah, catheter, is a, could be a catheter. It's a complex pericardial effusion, yeah. probably exudative uh, because of the septations. So yeah, whether right. that is that warrants some sort of pericardial drainage uh, or a surgical drainage considering SLE history before we think about taking the drain out. Yeah, great. Really good, really good spot there. So um, that was that was really nice, Ravi. Um, just in terms of thinking about actual bullet points about what we're going to say here. So the, the summary that the, um, we ended up saying here was that there is a residual large circumferential septated pericardial effusion measuring a maximal diameter of 2.8, I think on the images it was 2.6, inferior to the right atrium. Um, mildly elevated MV and TV inflow variability with septal wobble and abnormal RV free wall motion confined to systole and not diastole. So based on that, there are no echo features of tamponade, which correlates well with her clinical status. Remember, she was hemodynamically stable, no, no cardiovascular or respiratory support. <coughs> But we did say that cardiology consult was advised prior to removal of the drain in view of the residual large resid complex effusion. Um, and then the other features, just to note on her images, is that she does have mild concentric hypertrophy as well. And on that first image, there was also evidence of a, of a left-sided pleural effusion that is key not to miss. So I guess the, the, the reason I've included this case is that if someone's got rip roaring tamponade or just a small trivial pericardial effusion, then in a way it's quite easy. You know, we can see if there's like clear diastolic um, RV collapse, but um, often they end up in this kind of gray zone. And, uh, you know, in this case, there was still a large pericardial effusion. She was well in herself, but there were some kind of gray zone features, such as that, um, that tricuspid and mitral inflow variation that was not normal. Um, these are just some features comparing uh, the um, inflow variations and some of the hepatic vein and pulmonary vein dopplers and the septal movement comparing normal on the left and um, 
and in tamponade on the right. Um, and the other thing that's just key to, to for all of us to remember is just looking at what kind of respiratory support they're on because um, all of these mitral or LVOT flow variation things are all completely irrelevant if the person's mandatory ventilated. So they're not validated in that population, so we can't be using them frequently. And actually, you do often see that people do quote it even when um, they're ventilated. So this is just an example that it's not always as simple as just they're tamponade or they're not. Often there is that gray zone. And um, just for context, this, this girl ended up having to have a pericardial window because of the complex effusion. Um, any questions about that? Any more? Any anyone want to look at any of the images again, or are you okay to move on? So for for uh, you know for uh, looking at the respiratory variations, do we time it with the uh, respiratory cycle, or how do we exactly time it? Or do yeah, we just well, go can... by the so you can you can either just look at um, you can either just um, extend out the sweep speed slightly. So you can, uh, as I've done here, so you can see that there's um, there's clearly inflow variation here. Um, and if you've got enough of a um, of a if you've kind of slowed down your sleep sweep speed, you can see that variation. Um, the other trick that you can do is you can turn the um, on the physio, you can turn the respiratory cycle on on the echo machine, and so it will take the um, the cursors and uh, the, the um, ECG dots, and then it will it will plot a respiratory variation on the screen, and um, and that will give you a clear indication um, of when inspiration and expiration are as well. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Okay. So case. Oh, no, we, one, a couple more things, actually, sorry. So um, the other thing is just to say that, that um, effusions can also be quite atypical. So this uh, case on the top left, so this is actually a patient who'd got, who had a heart transplant and RV failure post-op and has got an RVAD in situ. And I'm not sure if you can see that there's something that looks slightly unusual, just posterior to the right atrium. And then... You can see the septal wobble in um, uh, in the image on the right, and you can see that this collection's gotten significantly bigger, and that all the systolic function just looks significantly worse. Um, and so this was someone who had a post-op um, collection that didn't just look simple and circumferential, but it was thrombus. Um, and then this is uh, the same image. So if someone wants to just um, talk through this this image, um, uh, Drew or, or Michael. Do you want to have a look at this? I see you laughing there. So do you want to, do you want to <laughs> talk through this picture? Oh, it is. Okay. They caught me giggling. Sorry, that was yeah. my... Okay. Punishment. Yeah, so we've got a parasternal short axis at the level of the mitral valve. Uh, you can see posterior to the LV, it looks like there's a oh fairly... It looks like the, there's a pericardial effusion and the the echo texture of it makes it look like it's maybe it's maybe it's clot. It's not as dark as, as something that would be a simple effusion, I suppose. Um, I can't see too much of it anteriorly, but it might look pretty similar to the fat, so it might be hard to see. Um, so the septum does look like it has a bit of bounce to it. Um, but overall the LV function from what I can see looks okay. I can't see too much of the RV. Maybe there's a catheter in the RV that I can see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. So again, this, this is that uh, same case. This patient had an RVAD in post-heart transplant. But this is, I find this quite a sobering image because this is someone who's got a post-op collection. Um, post-op collection. And um, just looking at how similar that clot looks to the myocardium is slightly terrifying. And actually this had already been missed on the previous echo uh, when it was a bit smaller. So it was only when this person deteriorated that, that it was picked up. All right, so can anyone just describe to me some complications of a pericardial fusion? Um, here we go. Oh, sorry, complications of drainage of the pericardial fusion. So um, yeah, anyone? So, like uh, related to the procedure itself, so trauma 
while doing the procedure or uh, uh, rupturing the right ventricle, entering the right ventricle, and the consequent to, uh, bleeding or yeah. introduction of infection. Yeah, nice. Introduction of air, like pneumo pneumopericardium post procedure. Nice. So we've got procedural complications. So it's great. What about the kind of post? Say the procedure's all gone perfectly. What's um, what are some complications that could manifest just a little bit later? There could be inflammation post uh, procedure leading to like sticky pericardium and then maybe constrictive pericarditis. Nice. Pericarditis. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Any any others? You can develop the the equivalent of um, like re expansion cardiac failure where once you've liberated the RV and LV really from the constriction that is the fluid, like the physiological constriction is the fluid, um, they hopefully temporarily lose function. So you can go into either RV, LV or biventricular failure following removal of all the fluid. Yeah, nice. So that's, um, so that's um, called a pericardial decompression syndrome. So um, Ben, do you want to just talk about the first image on the left? Um, just describe that that single image. Yeah, sure. So in this parasternal long axis, there's a circumferential large pericardial effusion. The RV free wall uh, looks to be collapsing. I can't see the complete ECG tracing, but uh, collapsing in at least half the cardiac cycle, probably partially systole and diastole. The left ventricle is moving and swinging freely or the whole heart swinging freely. I can't see the left ventricular cavity very well due to motion. Um, I do wonder if the cavity is obliterated <clears throat> um, and if this patient's a bit underfilled, coupled with this tamponade physiology, the risk of developing other complications, including dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Um, the fluid needs to be removed. Can't see anything posterior to the heart uh, due to the sector depth. So I don't know if there's a concurrent pleural effusion. Yes. And then on the image down the right, which is uh, after drainage, I can't see any fluid at the anterior aspect surrounding the right ventricle. However, I can't see it thickening or contracting at all. So I'm concerned about the contractile function of the RV. I can't see the interventricular septum contracting either, although the LV, um, uh, uh, antro, sorry, infralateral wall does appear to be thickening. So there is likely mild to moderate LV or mild dysfunction um, and I suspect there's severe impairment of RV function. Nice. Is there a pleural effusion there now? I'm not sure. That's yeah, there was a small pleural effusion. Yeah. On image too. So yeah, this great. So this this was actually a case um, of what you described, a pericardial decompression syndrome. So um, it's not fully understood. It's kind of the presence of either LV or RV failure or both after after drainage of a pericardial effusion. There's kind of multiple potential explanations for it, um, including changes uh, related to the ventricular interdependence and preload, afterload, mismatch. If the SVR is still very high due to compensation with the tamponade and then you've drained it, could it be a degree of kind of dependent ischemia or an autonomic imbalance? It's not completely clear, but um, it's something that we've actually seen quite a number of times in the past um, few, well, kind of past six months on our ICU. Chris, can... Uh, yeah. Can I ask about yeah. that, about this as a pathology? Um, is it associated with rapidity of drainage or volume taken out in one go, or is it more idiosyncratic? Uh, the data when I last looked at it was not very clear at all. Um, we definitely will try to drain these slowly to try to limit that risk of, um, uh, I mean, the, try to make sure there's not a dramatic rapid change in your kind of balance of, Kind of up preload afterload all that kind of stuff um the last one we drained we drained it very slowly and we and the patient still developed this so we tried but failed to prevent it um so i think it is it does seem to be related to rapidity of drainage but uh the the data on all of this is quite patchy yeah so thanks um and then if uh who else have we got so um drew do you want to have a uh quick go talking through this image. So this is also a patient who's recently had a pericardial drain put in um, and a drain's actually since been removed. 
Okay, um, so this is a parasternal long axis of the uh, left ventricle. Um, key things are is that there's a small residual pericardial fusion at the left uh, inferior lateral edge. Um, other structures that you can see is that there's uh, left ventricular, uh, moderate left, at least moderate left ventricular dysfunction. There's evidence of interventricular dependence and reduced radial contraction of the right ventricle. The left atrium is not clearly defined, although it does appear that it could be mildly dilated on this particular view. And uh, I'm not able to appreciate the aortic valve. Um, more deep to the pericardium, there appears to be a hypocoic structure, which uh, collection, which is likely a left pleural fusion. Awesome. Okay, so I'll just move on. This is a parasternal short axis view at the level of the mitral valve. Um, what I can see here is that there is in the inferior lateral space, there is a residual pericardial fusion, about two, uh, about one, less than one centimeter. Um, left ventricular function is poor and there's septal flattening in, uh, that appears to be respiratory dependent, but also lack of dependence with a septal wobble um, consistent with pressure overload from the right ventricle. Nice. Okay. This is a tricuspid valve inflow uh, to assess for any changes with respiration. Um, Although there's no numerical data, visually there appears to be a significant change with respiratory variation. I'm not sure if this patient is mechanically into, uh, mechanically ventilated. No, they're on high flow option. High flow. Uh, this is, these are uh, tissue dopplers of the mitral annulus, both lateral and medial, respectively. Um, key things that I'm looking for is, is possibly the presence of, of constriction. Um, uh, looking at the, uh, the, there's no numerical data to, to compare mm -hmm. the, the numbers, but it, it does appear the medial is greater than the lateral. Um, and it, it, once it's greater than eight, one is concerned about constrictive physiology um, and perhaps an annulus reversus. Awesome. We're, yeah, great. So that's, um... This is a, a patient who developed um, uh, constrictive pericarditis. So absolutely bang on. So there was that ventricular interdependence, the septal wobble, um, elevated tricuspid inflow variation and um, annulus reversus. So that was really good. Nice. All right. Chris, so, Chris oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, staying at pericardial effusion, I just yeah. had a question. Uh, it's just like a basic question, but when you have to demonstrate say in tamponade collapsibility of the chambers mm -hmm. is what's the objective way to do it like uh, is there an objective way or we just go by how we you know because they will be tachycardic and is there so, something you know like m mode or something like that so i guess it, it's it's about yeah. getting as many images as you, can, as you possibly can timing it in the respiratory cycle um remembering at what part of your cycle things are going to be collapsing so of, often you get right atrial you know, end systolic collapse um you you're timing it for um you know at least a third of the cardiac cycle is um or, or uh, yeah a third of the cardiac cycle is really important in um in your rv diastolic collapse probably the best way to be timing that a way that i like to use is, is using m mode in the parasternal long axis view and you can very clearly see that that diastolic collapse um obviously you've got to be aware of the fact that if you've got elevated right-sided pressures then you can get quite delayed collapse of of those early chambers and sometimes you do see left-sided collapse first if you've got things like pulmonary hypertension um, but then again, it's just trying to justify your clinical findings as well. You know, if someone's super tachypneic, then all your inflow variations are going to be off. Um, and if you're worried and someone's on presses and they've got a big pericardial effusion, then you can get atypical features. And it's about, you know, I, I would never just um, leave a pericardial effusion if I'm worried clinically about the patient. You know, I'd always try to be advocating for that to be drained. Thanks. Ooh. All right, so uh, this is hopefully a, quite a quick case, but this is a pretty standard um, one that we might 
be seeing. So, um, Chaturi, do you want to have a go at this one? So, yeah, this you. is um, this is a, a thirty-three-year-old who's um, had a ventriloscopy for a resection of the colloid cyst and an EVD sighted. Uh, so he's still intubated. He's on pressure support ventilation, twelve over five. Um, intermittent mandatory breaths when he's apneic, and he's just started having metramol requirements. So um, someone's come up to you, they know that you, you're you big on echo, and they've said, do you think this person's behind on fluids? We're quite keen to move them forwards. Okay. All right. So again, I'll go through this relatively quickly. And then we can talk about it at the end. Don't change it yet. Just go back, Chris. Ooh, sorry, sorry. I couldn't. I've just got to move my thing because I can't read my numbers. <laughs> What's the um the internal diameter in diastole there for the LV? Uh, four point one six okay. centimeters. Thank you. Sorry, lots on my screen. Are you happy for me to move on? Um, a lateral. Um, yep. Yeah. I just go back to the LVOT again. Okay. Yep, thank you. All right, so that's all you've got. So remembering the question, does this patient need fluids? So I guess you can summarize what you've seen so far, and then is there anything you'd want to do next to further research? Can I just see the first two pictures again, sorry, the parasternal long axis again? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it does this overall assessment and does this person need fluid? So overall they um LV function, RB function appears to be normal. The valves appear to be competent without any significant valvular lesions that I could see. And the diastolic function overall appears to be not significant. I don't think they've got significant diastolic dysfunction based off the Doppler parameters I've seen so far. In terms of um, LV function, I thought that was normal, and the LVOT VTI is encouraging, and the waveform is also a little bit dagger shaped in in nature. The cavity volume looks like it's preserved, and I would be I would give this person more fluid and see a response. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, so. I guess there are things though that we can do to have more accurately decide whether or not someone needs fluid. Um, can you think of in this in this kind of cohort of, of patient you know, who's on spontaneous breathing via ventilator, what kind of things can we do to elicit um, whether they're responsive other than just giving them fluids? You can you can do passive leg raise uh, test and yeah. assess alterations in their VTI with a post of passive leg raise test. Um, you can also look at their IVC on a positive pressure ventilator patient. It's a little bit different, but you can still assess for fluid responsiveness if they have elicitable collapsibility in their IVC. Um, what else could we do? Uh, Just describe how, how you would physically do a, do a passive leg raise and what, what assessment would you do? So 
you do an LVOT BTI with them in their current position, mm -hmm. and then you reverse to Prindellenberg the bed so that their legs are elevated above their chest, and you repeat the um, the LVOT BTI. And I feel like fluid responsiveness is like a thirteen percent increase in BTI from memory. Yeah, twelve or thirteen again, depending mm -hmm. on where you look. So classically, what's described is you have someone sat up at 45 degrees and then you lie them down or you get a VTI then you lie them down, put their legs up 45 degrees and then measure their LVOT VTI again one to two minutes later. Um, obviously, this patient's got a, um, an EVD, so that's got to be a little bit careful about changing their position rapidly. But uh, this is what we got from that. So we got a VTI increment of 13.5%. So as based on your values, that's potentially suggesting that he is responsive to fluids. Yeah. Um, and I guess, and so I guess the other thing just to say, this is bizarre summary. Um, it's a hemodynamic assessment. So including some, uh, some hemodynamic parameters as well, such as cardiac index. Um, and the other thing we've noticed is that there's no features suggesting that the patient is fluid in, intolerant. So fluid responsiveness is often a tricky topic to talk about, but often one that we are asked to look at. But the key thing is this person doesn't seem like if they've got raised left atrial pressure, they haven't got RV failure, they haven't got fixed and dilated IVC. And you can also um, extend it to look at the lung fields as well to make sure that they haven't got any, um, any uh, significant beeline profile. Yeah. So the way that I was always taught was that you can use some of the static parameters initially. Are the features of frank hypovolemia? Is there a very, very small LV internal diameter? Um, is there a complete papillary apposition? Is there a very small IVC um, that's completely collapsing? Or is the LV end diastolic area very small? So these are features potentially that indicate that there's frank hypovolemia. Obviously, you want to be um, ex careful if you've got things like LVH or a significant vasodilated state that um, you don't want to miss that. There is a hand up and it's Professor Ord. Thanks, Chris. I was just wondering if I can ask one more question before yeah. you, uh, uh, before we go there. Chat, what are the, yeah. um, what are the problems with this measurement? So everything you said was correct, but I think um, it, it's, the, the next part would be just problems with this. Are you frozen or thinking? Oh. What are the problems with what measurement? Passive leg raising measurement. So the, the conclusion was that- uh, Is this me or is he like talking underwater? He's- Oh, can you hear me okay? There we go. Sam, can you ask that again? You, you, cut, you cut off. Sorry. Chat, what All are right. the problems <laughs> with the, that measurement? So what are the- You frozen. To you, mate. <laughs> you oh. sound like you're drunk. No, I'm not, I'm sober, I promise. So can you hear what me? This time? Issues with the passive. What are the complications of the passive leg raising uh, measurement? <laughs> the issues with the passive leg raising measurement. It's really annoying to do, especially if you've got patients who have got EBDs and things in. It's very irritating to do. And it's probably, I think it's what Chris said, if they've got no features of like being, of giving fluids a problem, then I'm more inclined to just give the fluid than to bother with a passive leg raise test to be in my own clinical practice, to be honest. Um, the other issues with passive leg raising in mechanically ventilated patients it is validated um and what else is there it's annoying it's hard often in our patients to get the measurement so getting an lvot and getting a good lvot uh pulse wave doppler signal is important and so if you and a 13 percent variability is not much and so if you don't have good identical measurements each time in your lvot then you might not get a 13 percent variability in your measurement uh, would be one, the second one, other than the logistics of it. Uh, and it's dependent on loads of 
other things. So just the LVOT BTI on a passive leg raise test is a one very crude assessment of overall cardiac function and volume status and load status. And so if the patient had that patient's echo was relatively normal, if that a patient had dilated atria or evidence of elevated diastolic LV pressures and things, I'd be more cautious in interpreting a positive passive leg raise test and giving fluids based off of that. That's all I can got. Not bad. Any more from anyone else? Um, there, can I think be, it's, it's, there can be stroke volume variation with, uh, say, right ventricular failure. Um, if the patient, say, is severe asthmatic and is working very hard, they generate huge negative intraporeal pressure. That can right. cause a lot of variation. The patient is in atrial fibrillation. They can have stroke volume variation. So all that will be confirmed as... Very nice, very nice indeed, yeah. Open abdomens, you can't do it in Open either. Abdomens. Yeah, so just a few more to pick in there. I'm not sure you can start with, it's really annoying because it's <laughs> the, uh, it's got the best evidence out of everything other than the uh, SVC, particularly in spontaneously breathing patients. So the evidence is really strong for it, but we still don't do it because I think it's not easy to do, like you said, because it's really easy not to be measuring it in exactly the same place. So the tip and trick that I do for that is just keep your hand on the patient, get someone else to move the ped, and then you do the measurement without the probe moving. If you take your hand off and you put it back on, there's the argument you could be in a slightly different plane. So that's one thing with the imaging. The second tip and trick is that you've got to lay them down flat again, put them back in after you've laid them down flat, put them back in the same position they were in before and see if it gets reversed. So that's the last thing to, to, to try and do. Uh, the third thing is, uh, oh, what's wrong with my brain? Um, yeah, uh, then after you've given the fluid bolus, make sure that you've lost the respiratory variation. Uh, is the is the plan so it yeah it's it's, it's got the best evidence but just it, you've got to know the problems with doing it which come down with imaging moving the patient and arrhythmias spontaneously breathing patients taking extra efforts of their chest so you're getting false positive results um and using all the clinical assessment in the arsenal mm. and the, the, the only other one is pain you know, we we move our ICU patients and often they're in pain. So you lift up their legs and suddenly they get a load of pain, they get a load of endogenous catecholamines and they increase their cardiac output. So that's the only other one to add for that. Well, sorry, was this, uh, I missed a bit of it, but was this true for ventilated patients? So moving on to this. So we, we've kind of talked about the static parameters, but this is, I, I guess, quite a nice way, just using transthoracic echo of looking at what summaries we have for volume responsiveness and looking at how the, re the respiratory effort and you know, their mode of ventilation is really, really important. So if, they're com if they have complete mandatory ventilation, then using things like VTI variation, using the IVC distensibility index are, are validated ways of doing it and whilst understanding the, the cautions associated with it. But if they're just spontaneously breathing or in any sort of mixed ground between mandatory and spontaneous ventilation, then um, uh, often you, if you really wanna know, then you need to be able to do um, a passive leg raise, see for sure. Cool, okay. So just in, given that we are running out of time slightly. So the third case, is a is a toe so it's a 80 year old female with a history of triple vessel coronary artery disease and incidental moderate to severe mitral regurgitation and possibly as on a tte she's hemodynamically stable um it's a toe specifically for valvular assessment and there is conscious sedation at the moment with fentanyl and midazolam so i don't want everyone to feel left out so shall we say so joe do you want to take the aortic valve i can't so i might have to rush oh. down to ed for a particular okay. ECMO in a couple of minutes <laughs> fair enough uh, that seems reasonable uh uh Prithby, do you want to take the aortic valve to start with um yep and who else is here uh miles do you want to do the mitral valve yeah sure i'll have a go and then who wants to do the LV? 
Uh... Michael, do you want to do the LV? Why not? Okay, so I'm going to go through these relatively slowly um, because there's plenty of pathology on there. And then we'll go through uh, one at a time and, and you can take your respective area. I'm just going to move this down. Okay, so I can go back as many of those as you want. Um, should we start with the aortic valve? Can I just have a run through the pics one more time, please? Yeah, of course. All right, you ready to go? Yep. Okay, so aortic valve uh, on 2D, uh, there is definitely uh, a thickening of the aortic valve and uh, opening is uh, restricted, but it is not severely restricted. There is definitely an amount of calcium and, and thickening of the uh, valve. The... Um, So which which cusp is restricted? Uh, anyone else? It's a non-coronary cusp. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice, very good. Coronary cusp. Yeah. So the non the non always sits on a fence, always sits over the intellectual okay. septum. Yeah. It's a bit confusing on this view, I know, because it's yeah, pipeline. I was trying so, to see. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, uh, but it is not, the opening is not severely restricted. Uh, on the color flow uh, imaging, um, that didn't seem to be a significant amount of uh, aortic regurgitation. Uh, uh, so I think the predominant pathology is. Uh, uh, aortic stenosis, but uh, looking at the gradients, 
um, and uh, the DSI um, and uh, aortic valve area is 1.3, the DVA is 0.46, uh, all putting it in a sort of more of a moderate uh, aortic stenosis category than a severe aortic stenosis. Also, I'm going by the 2D uh, pictures, which shows reasonable amount of opening of the aortic valve. But the one caveat I see is the left ventricular function is not normal. So it is probably at least eyeballing moderately impaired, if not severely impaired. So that would affect the gradients. Um, uh, so I'm aware of that, but still the uh, the dimensional severity index is 0.46, which is usually independent of the left ventricular function, uh, and that seems to be above 0.25. Um, so putting everything together, I would uh, put this uh, in a more of a moderate aortic stenosis category. Nice. And what could you do to... Um, uh... Because yeah, said, so uh, to, to look at it better, I would uh, look at it in other views, uh, use of axis imaging. Uh, I would probably consider a, a transesophageal echocardiogram to see, uh, to look at the valve better. Um, uh, if the patient is started on um, any anotropic therapy, for example, then that would help me quantify the, uh, um, uh, you know, the gradients better with an improved left ventricular function. Um, nice. I would also look at the upstream and downstream effects of the um, aortic valve in terms of left ventricular function, looking at the aortic root uh, and the aorta and the effect on the right ventricle. Yeah, very good. Um, just stay careful with um, your kind of spiel saying, you know, I would do this and that because this is is a transesophageal echo. So yeah. um, it, admittedly, it was mine. So you could say that you want someone else to do a transesophageal echo, which is reasonable. But uh, yeah. Um, okay, good. So um, and, and the magic, the magic stroke volume index to say that this is kind of a low flow state. What's that? What's thirty-five. That? Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So less than thirty-five. So it's low flow state. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Mitral valve. Was that? Uh, did I ask Miles? That yeah. was. Yeah, so um, from what I remember the pictures, I think I'm concerned there's at least moderate mitral vegetation. Uh, you can see a 2D defect. I think someone had measured a VC of 0.5, which is not in a severe range, but I'd be concerned there's additional pictures of severity because it's an eccentric jet. Uh, it looks like there's some coanda kind of wall hugging happening in some of those views. I can't quite piece together whether there's two jets based on the images that I can see, but I'm concerned that there could be, and that could be further colorated with 3D. Um, the fact that you can appreciate the um, PISA, um, sorry, the flow convergence zone puts you kind of past um, mild in terms of origin uh, of it. I guess the LV appears dilated, so you can see um, concerned that it's functional. The valve leaflets do appear thickened, but don't appear to be focally restricted in terms of the being a focal leaflet problem causing um, uh, causing regurgitation, and the fact that the LV function appears impaired with evidence of pulmonary hypertension, again, makes you think that it's more severe mitral vegetation. So overall, I'd say it's probably severe, um, eccentric, um, uh, what, posterior inferiorly directed um, MR, which is likely functional in nature. Okay, great. Um, so just, just talking about it being functional, um, the functional regos with an eccentric jet, um, just talking about mechanism, uh, functional mitral regurgitation is often quite central. Um, so uh, just looking at this valve, I know that I haven't included all the pictures, but particularly looking at what the regional wall motion abnormalities could be on this image, then um, you know, there is concern that maybe that, that um, posterior mitral valve leaflet is a little bit retracted, a little bit tethered, um, and that it could be causing then eccentric regurgitation. But um, everything else, great. Um, all the kind of severity assessments can put it in that moderate category. Uh, but uh, the fact that it's, that you rightly identified it's an eccentric jet, you probably need to bump it up a, a severity a se a severity grade. All right, that's great. Um, but we could not elucidate um, systolic flow reversal, unfortunately. And then just finally, quickly looking at the so, LV. What, what scallops he thinks from the mitral valve? Which where, where's the regurg from? Uh, uh, 
So in that view in the uh, top left, that's, um, are we talking about P2 there? Is that the problem? Yeah, P2 and? Oh, so P2A2 are the two that are co-opting in that view, but the P2 yeah. looks like it's the problem. Got, uh, got it, got it, got it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Nice. And lastly, just quickly about the left ventricle, we've already talked about it very slightly. Yeah, so so just be, based on this view. It looks at least moderately impaired. Um, it, I'm not sure if on this view here, there's there's like an uh, there's a structure in the LV uh, that could be a thrombus. I'm not really sure if that's just the the image quality. Um, and it appears there are some regional warm motion abnormalities. It's a little bit tricky to see with the frame rate. Um, it's hard for me to. I couldn't. I couldn't say really. It, it just looks. It's. It looks like it's globally impaired, and there's probably some regional warm motion. I, I know that's a cop out. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent, that's a cop out. <laughs> Is it inferior, Chris? Yeah, so it looks yeah, like it's nice. probably inferior, uh, and maybe infralateral. Yeah, but certainly at least inferior. Um, yeah, definitely. So inferior here, it's definitely not not contracting as well as this is here. And um, although it's just slightly off off the image, probably the um, infraceptal and infralateral as well. Yeah. Which would fit with that uh, posterior valve leaflet. Yeah, nice. Awesome. So the summary that we had there was that LV function is severely impaired, hypokinesis of inferior infraceptal and infralateral walls, severe mitral regurgitation with eccentric posteriorly directed jet, likely mechanism, secondary to ischemic mitral regurgitation with posterior leaflet tethering, um, thickening of the aortic valve with focal thickening, calcification, and restriction of the non coronary cusp, moderate aortic stenosis, peak velocity and mean gradient underestimated in the setting of reduced LV systolic function and mitral regurgitation. Cool. I question the severe MR call. So the severe MR call was based on the fact that everything points to moderate, except for the fact that it was a very eccentric jet with borderline hypotension at the time, which obviously we haven't discussed, and also um, and with the severe LV function, yeah. we knocked it up a grade. Yeah, but just, I just would argue that's, that's what PISA is for. It can try and help try and counteract some of that because you get the MR included in it. Um, but at least you didn't put moderate to severe. So um, I'm happy with severe in that regard. I'll, put, I'll change the report to moderate to severe. For Thanks, please don't. It's beautiful just as it is. It's lovely. Please don't. All right. And the, and the last case, just quickly, um, uh, included for interest mostly. So this is a this is a 12-year-old who was who presented to um, a, the tertiary transplant center at two in the morning, aeromedical, for, uh, with fulminant liver failure. Um, and the reason they were transferred there was for transplant assessment. So the six day history of progressive liver failure and the liver screen was negative so far. The patient was intubated, paralyzed for transfer and was on mandatory ventilation. They were in aneuric renal failure and they arrived requiring um, 0.3 mites per kilo of noradrenaline. And even though we had we had no pediatric cardiology in that hospital, and so they wanted a focused assessment from the <clears throat> adult sonographer um, for an assessment of shock state due to the catecholamine requirement. All right. So who wants to have a look? Dr. Gahadi? Not Chris Duncan. Do you want to have a look at this one? I would love to butcher this because it's a 12 year old. Uh, I think he's doing great and I won't feel bad at all. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, so could you go back for a second? I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't realize that was, yep. Oh yeah, so I want me to put it all together at the end. Yep. Yeah, sure. Thanks.
All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, all right. Look, the most concerning feature uh, in this case is that there appears to be a uh, left to right shunt, potentially a ventricular septal defect from those initial images uh, with flow from the aorta into the right ventricle. There's a uh, volume and pressure overloaded right heart with, ven with uh, interventricular septal flattening throughout systole and diastole. On the color across the um, uh, atrial and ventricular septum, there's likely uh, a ventricular septal defect as well as an atrial septal defect, actually. So there could be an underlying AVSD. Um, again, giving right heart failure. Um, this patient appears to have, this patient has free flowing tricuspid regurgitation. It has evidence on color Doppler and on the continuous wave Doppler that was, I think, the next cycle over. So this is a cardiothoracic surgical emergency, um, potentially. The left ventricular systolic function um, is moderately impaired. Uh, the right ventricular systolic function, given the extent of RV overload, I would say is moderately impaired um, because it can still generate some pressure, uh, although it is a dilated right ventricular, as I said earlier. Um, there was an IVC. Next screen. Don't know what the normal size is for a 12 year old IVC. I'm going to guess smaller than an adult. Um, and this looks to be at least one, two, three centimeters. Um, with no variation, knowing that they're mechanically ventilated. And there is um, reverse flow in diastole, um, which is indicative of uh, uh, ventricular interdependence and uh, impaired right ventricular function. That's about it. <clears throat> awesome. I'll just show you this last picture as well. What, um, Oh yeah. So this is an off-axis. Is this an off-axis parasternal long you've got on the top? Yeah. Or what, Elvis? Yeah, yeah. And it's a short on the bottom. Yeah. So that yeah, this looks to have flow. So I initially was concerned this was a ventricular septal defect, a membranous VSD. And um, whether this is actually a flow from the aorta uh, instead, I'm not sure. No, I'm out. Nice. So this was a um, <clears throat> this was a this this poor little boy had a um, uh, sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. Yeah. Right. Okay. What's well, so the order? Not there. that you could. Okay. Just about see here this windsock deformity that's coming there. That's it's flicking just in there. Yeah. The tricuspid valve, and that had ruptured. Um, okay. And I guess the reason I'm showing this, firstly, um, I also realized that Sam included a, a ruptured science about our aneurysm a few sessions ago, but um, uh, it's a young boy who we had no one else who would scan them, and we were still required to have a look for any gross abnormalities, and that is something that we did find. I guess the key thing is showing that um, the upstream and downstream consequences are super important. So this is an aortic arch view, and this is showing severe flow reversal within the descent yeah, right. aorta. Okay. Um, and then, so that's an upstream consequence. Yep. And then we've also, sorry, that, that was a downstream consequence, and then this is an upstream consequence. So big dilated IVC. You can see on color Doppler that you've got flow reversal within the hepatic veins. And I'd yeah. probably say that this is there's probably some systolic flow reversal here as well. It's not completely clear, but um, I'd probably say that that's yeah. systolic flow reversal. Um, and the this this kid had gone through three or four different hospitals already, had already had surgery, and he hadn't had an echo yet. And so this is um, all congestive hepatopathy and congestive renal failure. And after this was fixed, everything resolved on its own. Is there so, systolic and diastolic flow reversal there? Probably, yeah, probably. Just, just, yeah. just after the P wave. Is that mm. just an A wave, is it? Just a, a prominent A wave. Prominent A wave, I think, yeah. Right, okay, okay. And a restrictive filling of a right atrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, prominent A wave. 
And Chris, if there was a, ever a better case for why critical care physicians should learn advanced echocardiography, I can't think of it. That's a, that's an extraordinary case. Good on you. All right. And that's all I've got for, for you. Any questions at all? Chris, that was an unreal session. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much for uh, such a great session. Were there, were there any questions left for Chris? Can I ask a dumb one? Maybe just about the volume state response, uh, fluid responsiveness and passive leg raise testing. You're measuring your um, LVOT VTI. You've got a patient who's got respiratory variation. Um, in terms of comparing like with like, do you just need to compare the same respiratory phase? Should you compare expiration with expiration? Should you compare your best VTI with your best VTI? Like what's the right answer? What's the right way to do that? If you're only looking for 13%. Uh, I normally do end expiration, um, and I guess as long as you match your uh, the same part of the respiratory cycle, it, it, it shouldn't really matter. But I think convention is end expiration. In the same place, in the, yeah. in the same pulse wave Doppler, same place, don't move your hand, tilt them down, tilt them back up, see if it reverses, it goes out. Make sure you're not getting a false negative or false positive. Give some fluid, do it again, make sure it's gone away. And, and I guess the, the other thing is um, just re also repeating the fluid tolerance stuff. If you're giving them fluid, just make sure that you're not pushing them over the edge. Keep an eye on that left atrial pressure. Keep an eye on that right ventricle. Um, see what you know, everything is as a whole. Um, and I, I'm, I must say nowadays, I, I'm kind of with you, uh, Chaturi. I, I, I tend to um, not do a passive leg raise if I can avoid it. Um, but you know, just giving mini fluid boluses and then assessing response dynamically, uh, making sure I'm not pushing uh, pushing them over the edge in terms of tolerance, and then and then go from there. But from an exam perspective, I think it's important to know. I'm afraid because yeah. the evidence is there, so you do need to know it for the DDU very much, um, and uh, just knowing about the false negatives, false positives are important. So things like right ventricle failure with the septum moving around is going to give you respiratory variation, awake <laughs> patients taking breathing, going to give you a false positive. If you're mandatory ventilated and you've got low tidal volumes, now ideally in mandatory ventilated, you've got to be on like eight to 10 mils per kilogram, per ideal body weight transiently. You know, that's going to give you, if you're too low, it's going to give you false negative results. Just know some of those pearls and pitfalls about the good things and bad things about doing it, but it does have good uh, it does have good evidence, but there, there's a paper that came out when they talk about the ones in mandatory ventilated patients, you know, you can actually only do it in something like 7% of intubated patients on the ICU or something, or 7% of patients in the ICU when they did it in a multi-center study. So that kind of supports Chathry's idea that we can't do it in many patients. Mm -hmm. Um, and the last thing to say is that the values they talk about are 12 to 13%. I think a good candidate in there talks about actually using 20% because there's a gray zone always, right? So they give you these cutoffs very clearly about responders and non-responders. Then they talk about that gray zone, just give yourself a little extra buffer. So the experts tend to recommend using 20% as your cutoff. Uh, so you avoid those false negatives. Do I mean avoiding false positives? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, worth worth knowing for the exam. Um, unless there are any other questions, I think that's time. Just uh, Chris, thanks again. That was a cracking session. Cheers, buddy. Good one, Chris. Thanks, Chris, and thanks. Thank Sam. you. Right. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.